and that's what we're going to talk about. And I have a graphic that I think is going to illustrate this. Hunter, could you put that up for me? Okay, so I made this chart here, and this is the hours that your child is awake, basically. Okay, so that's assuming they sleep 10 hours, so give or take a little bit, depending on how much your kid sleeps. Okay, but if we look at this, they're in school for about 20 hours of their waking hours, or 20%, sorry, 20% of their waking hours, and they're in church for about 4%. Now, I calculated this based on what we offer here at Troy First for children's ministry. So that would be if you went to both services every single Sunday, you never missed a Sunday, you never missed a service. Um, that would be if you came to Awana every single Wednesday night and never missed. Um, if you participated in basketball and soccer, never missed a practice or a game, you came to VBS. So I tried to find everything we could possibly do. So 4% may even be a little high. That would be if you never missed anything. Okay, and you see, even with 4%, there's still 76% of other discretionary time that you have. And I think just by looking at this, we can see that it's kind of foolish to think that the church should be the primary discipler of your children, just from looking at these um, percentages here. Okay, so like I said, that's kind of, kind of the main point. That's really um, kind of what I want to focus on is just our responsibility as parents to disciple our children. Uh, the goal is not to cause any regret or any shame or any guilt or anything like that, okay? Um, but I think we should take that resp responsibility seriously. And I hope that tonight um, you can be encouraged in that area, you can be equipped in that area, and that you would be excited to go home and disciple your children. Okay, so with that being said, I want to start with some common misconceptions first. Okay, so some common misconceptions. There's a lot of lies out there about what parenting is. Okay, and if we're being honest, we've probably all uh, been deceived in one way or another by some of these different lies. So uh, we're going to start here. The first myth, I'm going to call it the behavior modification myth. Okay, the world tells us that the goal of parenting is for our kids to act a certain way or to be perfect kids, right? And sometimes we feel the pressure of that, okay? But I'm here to tell you the goal of parenting is not to have perfect kids, okay? Of course, we want them to behave. We want them to be polite. We want them to do all of those things. But if that's the goal, then we're missing the mark, okay? And I, this might come as a surprise to you, okay? So brace yourself, but your kids are not going to be perfect, okay? Some of you guys are a little surprised, I know. Uh, but they're not going to be perfect, okay? They're going to make mistakes just like we do. And think of it this way, okay? Raise your hand, raise it high if you had to teach your kid to be selfish. Did anybody in here have to sit down with their child and, like, teach them to be selfish? Probably not, right? Um, I didn't either. I just thought my kids were advanced, though. I guess not. Um, <laughs> but I don't know about you guys. I never had to teach them to be mean to their siblings. I never had to teach them to lie, to like stay out of trouble or be deceitful, right? So um, it's really, it's about so much more than just behavior modification. It's about the heart of our child, okay? And um, we certainly don't want to raise whitewashed tombs that are only concerned about their behavior and their outward appearance. So we really want to get to the heart of our child. Um, so the second one, I'm going to call it the achievement myth. Okay, so the world tells you that your goal is to have high-achieving children. Okay, but the goal of parenting is not to have high-achieving children. Of course, we want to teach our kids to work hard. We want them to pursue excellence in everything they do. Okay, but again, if that is the goal of parenting, then you're missing the mark. Okay, I see so many parents who really push their kids and are extremely hard on their kids in academics or sports or music or whatever it is, and they invest all of their time and all of their energy into these things. And the reality is, even if um, your kid gets a full ride to Harvard or plays a professional sport or wins a Grammy or is president of the United States, whatever it is, um, if they have not surrendered their life to Jesus Christ, then that is still gonna, they're still going to be empty. Um, so I think... We just need to keep the main thing the main thing. We need to keep our perspective on what matters most. And of course, by all means, we want to teach our kids, like I said, to work hard. We want to teach them to pursue excellence. Um, but we can't prioritize those, those things over their relationship with God. And a good 
a good quote that I really like that goes with that. It says, don't sacrifice what matters most for what matters now. And I think sometimes uh, we're prone to do that. So the third one and the final one, there's plenty we could talk about, but um, the final one I wanna say, I'm gonna call it the comfort myth, okay? So the world will tell you that your goal is to shelter your children and make them really comfortable and really happy, okay? Um, that's not the goal. Of course, that's part of our responsibility as parents, right? To provide for our kids, to protect them. Um, but if that is the goal, then again, we're missing the mark. And as much as we want to, we will never be able to protect them from everything in this world. And I remember the first time I realized that. So um, I got a question, okay? So raise your hand if you've ever watched your kids sleep before. Anybody? All right, good. I thought I was the only one. I was nervous for a minute, okay? Anybody who didn't raise their hand, don't judge until you've done it, okay? Um, I would suggest you do it because no matter how crazy your child is, no matter how rambunctious they are, when they're sleeping, they're calm and they're peaceful, and you can actually like say they're cute and, and uh, really enjoy that time with them, okay? It's a great time. Um, so anyway, I remember the first time I realized this, I was standing there and I was just watching my kids sleep. Sometimes before I go to bed, I'll, I'll go through their rooms, I'll watch them sleep for a minute, pray over them. And I remember I was standing there watching them and I just saw how comfortable they were, how safe they were, how peaceful they were. And I just realized like, life is difficult and they're gonna suffer, right? Like our kids are gonna go through really difficult stuff. They're gonna have people hurt them, they're gonna face adversity, um, and they're gonna suffer. They're gonna, they're gonna go through hard times. And as much as I want to, I can't protect them from all of those things, right? I want to, but I can't, okay? So instead of um, focusing on protecting them, I think we should focus on also preparing them. And I think that's a, a distinction that we need to make. Uh, so I can't possibly protect them from all of those things, but I can prepare them. And again, part of our job as parents is to protect and provide for our children, but ultimately we want to prepare them so they know how to handle adversity when it comes. Because it's coming. I guarantee you it's coming. John, in John 16, Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world, but be courageous, I have conquered the world. So I think our job as parents is to disciple our children so they know where true peace comes from, even in the midst of suffering. We should disciple our children so that they know where to turn to in difficult situations. We need to shift our perspective from protecting them to preparing them so that we can equip them for these different situations they'll have in their lives. Um, so again, we could go on and on, but those are just a few of the myths that the world tells us about parenting. But I think the most important thing we can do is find out what the Bible says about parenting, okay? Because that's what matters. And I don't, I don't wanna spend my entire life climbing a ladder just to realize that it's leaning against the wrong wall, right? So that's a quote I've heard and it stuck with me. Like, I wanna make sure that my ladder is leaning against the proper wall. Uh, so we have to ask, what is the goal of parenting and what should our target be? Um, and in order to answer this question, we're gonna look at Deuteronomy 6, five through nine. I think it's gonna be on the screen. It's also in uh, your little booklet. So as always, context is key when you're reading scripture. Uh, this is the final book of the Pentateuch, and uh, which that's the first five books of the Bible, which Moses, Moses wrote. Um, and in this passage, God is speaking through Moses to address the Israelites before they go into the promised land. Okay, um, he's reminding them of what God has done in the past, um, who God is, and he's reminding them what God has commanded them, and really he's giving instructions so that they can prosper and flourish when they enter the promised land, and not just for the immediate future, but for generations to come. Even just in chapter six, there's several times where uh, that multi-generational perspective is brought forth, um, and and. I think it's obvious that when we read verses five through nine, that raising our children to know God is the best way to flourish, right? Because he knew that as time went on, 
if, they, if parents weren't doing their job of discipling their children, that it would no longer be what God created it to be. So I'm going to read uh, chapter 6, verses 5 through 9 here to start with. It says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These words that I am giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your city gates. So I love this passage because it shows us what is most important. It tells us what's most important. It shows us that we should love God and pursue him and that our families should be established on the firm foundation of God's word. It reminds me of a quote. I use it frequently. I'm sure many of you have heard me say it. Some of you are probably tired of hearing me say it, but the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing, and this is the main thing. So passage, or sorry, verse 5, Jesus refers to this as the greatest commandment in all the synoptic gospels. He also quotes Leviticus 19 as a second but equal commandment. So quoting that, in Matthew 22, Jesus says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then I love this part. It gets left off a lot of times. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. So everything depends on this. This is the first step in discipling your children. The first step in discipling your children is your discipleship. It's your relationship with God. The first step in discipling your children is your heart. This goes before any instructions or teaching on uh, parenting or discipling your children, and for good reason. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard this before, the old do as I say, not as I do. That philosophy doesn't work very good. It's our responsibility to be the model for our children. So for me, it's my responsibility to model what a godly man is for my son Isaiah so that he can see and understand and know what biblical manhood is. It's my responsibility to model what a godly man is for my daughters, for Hadassah, Miriam, and Priscilla so that they can seek a godly man to marry someday. And if we don't teach and model biblical manhood for our children, then the world is going to teach them what a man is. And I don't know if you guys have noticed this or not, but the world's pretty confused about that topic right now. I'm not even going to go there. That's another topic for another day. Uh, but it says we are to love the Lord with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our strength. And this represents the whole person. Every part of our being should be fully surrendered to God. We must walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. And like I said, that's the first step in discipling our children. And if you move on to verse 6, he says, these words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Um, the New Living Translation says, you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. You must commit yourselves wholeheartedly, and it must be upon your heart. In Jeremiah 31, 33, it says that God will put his law in our minds and write it upon our hearts. And when it says upon your heart, it means that it's in your constant and conscious reflection. Okay, it's to be the foundation that everything else is built on. It means having a biblical worldview. And it means that God's word impacts everything that we do, all aspects of our lives, not just compartmentalized areas of our lives. So the first point there is biblical parenting begins with our hearts. So it starts with us first. It starts with our hearts first. And only after that, then, can we start discipling our children. So as we move on to verse 7, it starts giving us some... Uh, some instruction on parenting. It says, repeat them to your children. And some translations will say to teach them diligently to your children or to impress them on your children. And I think the word image here is kind of lost in translation sometimes, but imagine a person who takes like a hammer and a chisel and etches God's word into a slab of stone. 
It's really the word image is inscribing or engraving something. Okay, so imagine the amount of time and precision that would take. If you had a big slab of stone in front of you and you had a hammer and a chisel and you had to chisel God's word into it, right? That's a pretty daunting task. It would take a long time. It would take a lot of swings of the hammer, okay? And it would be a lot of slow progress, one swing at a time. But over time, you would start to see progress. It's the same for us when we're discipling our children, Every night that we read and pray with them before bed would be like a swing of the hammer hitting the chisel. Every teachable moment, every difficult conversation, every time we model godly living to them, every, um, every time we apologize to them, that was something we talked about at our table. All of these things, they may not seem like a big deal in the moment, but over time, each one of them is like a swing of the hammer. And over time, it makes a difference. Over time, the person engraving that would have God's word etched into that slab of stone, and it would be there to stay. And as we continue reading, verse 7 gives us a little bit more practical application on how to do this. It says, to talk about them in your home and on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. So I'm certainly no... uh, literary scholar here, but I'm told that when you pair two contrasting things like that, it's called a merism, okay? It's a literary device. And basically, whenever you put those two uh, contrasting terms next to each other, it gives you an all-encompassing concept. So an example of this that we have heard and we, would, we probably maybe have even used before is when someone says they've searched high and low for something. Right? That doesn't mean they only searched on the top shelf and then they looked on the ground and they didn't look anywhere else in between. It means they looked everywhere. It's all-encompassing. Okay, and we have two of those here in just this one verse. We have, so it's called a double merism. All right, so it says, at home and on the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Okay, so that doesn't necessarily just mean that those are the times you're supposed to, to talk about them with your children. Okay, but it's all encompassing. It means that it should be a part, every, every part of our life should be encompassed with that. So that tells me we should be constantly impressing God's word into our children. We should be explaining to them God's word. It should be a part of everything we're doing. Okay? It shouldn't just be compartmentalized. And that is how we establish a biblical worldview, a cohesive biblical worldview, not a fragmented worldview. And then we get to verse 8 and 9, and um, this part's a little bit more difficult to understand in our context here, but um, it says that they should be on our hands and our foreheads, it should be on the doorposts of our home and on the city gates. Okay, so I don't want to go too far down this rabbit trail because we don't have time for it, Um, but people would wear scripture on their hands and on their forehead, um, and it was essentially a tool designed to keep God's word front of mind, okay? They would put it on their head um, to, to recognize that God's word should control our thoughts, and it was on their hands to recognize that God's word should control our actions. Um, people also would put specific verses on the doorposts of their home and on their city gates, okay? And it was a reminder to them every time they walked in that they were um, obligated to obey God's word, okay? It was also a symbol for other people when they entered your home or they entered the city gates as well, okay? So I think when we look at this passage, we can see that biblical parenting is about nurturing the heart of our children. So it starts with our heart, and then it leads to us nurturing their heart. Like I said, it's not behavior modification. It's about their heart, okay? And our goal should be to establish a biblical worldview for our children so that they understand the way God created the world to function. Now, after saying all that, I do feel a conviction to say that we do not have the power to save our kids. I wish that we did. I wish I had the power to save my kids, okay? But they have that decision to make just like we do. They have to make that decision on their own just like each one of us has to make that decision on our own. Jesus came to make salvation available to all people, but not everyone will accept the gift of eternal life. 
So it's our job as parents and our job as Christians to just be faithful and planting seeds and watering seeds. And God is the one who causes the increase. So we do this by teaching God's word to our children. We do this by teaching them how to pray. We do this by teaching them how to serve. And ultimately, we do it by modeling a life that's fully surrendered and obedient to Jesus. And that is how you establish a biblical worldview. Um, so I think it's difficult because I think if we're being honest, we all know what we're supposed to do, right? Like we all know what we should do. We, we know um, what God calls us to do, but sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes there, we're pulled in so many different directions. That was something else we talked about at our table, just how busy our culture is, how busy life can get, how we're pulled in so many different directions. And we just live in such a busy and distracted culture. So um, God calls us to be intentional, though. I've said it many times. I think the Christian life is an intentional life. Proverbs 14.8 is one of my favorite pat, or verses in Scripture, and it says, The wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways, but the folly of the fool is deception. The wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to his ways. So I think, I know that God calls us to give thought to our ways. We shouldn't just do things because that's how it, what everybody else is doing. We shouldn't just do things because that's how it's always been done. Um, and there's a great story I heard that illustrates this well. Some of you may have heard it before. I'm going to read it to you anyway. So even if you've heard it, just do me a favor and pretend like you haven't before, okay? Um, so... A mother was preparing a pot roast for her family's Easter meal while her young daughter helped. Knowing her daughter was very curious, the mother explained each step. As she was preparing to put the pot roast in the oven, the mother explained, now we cut the ends off of each side of the meat. As, the young, girl, as young children often do, the daughter asked, why? The mother thought for a moment and replied, because that's the way it's done. That's how your grandma did it, and that's how I do it. Not satisfied with this answer, the young girl asked if she could call her grandma. The young girl called and asked, Grandma, why do you cut the ends off the pot roast? The grandma thought for a moment and said, because that's the way it's done. That's how my mom did it, and that's how I do it. Still not satisfied, the young girl called her great-grandma, who is now living in a nursing home. Great-grandma, she said, why do you cut the ends off the pot roast? Her great-grandma said, when I was a young mother, we had a very small oven, and the pot roast wouldn't fit in the oven <laughs> if we didn't cut the ends off of it. Isn't that a good story? So two generations later, all these years, they've been wasting all this meat, right? Uh, just because that's how it's always been done. Okay, so we ought not do things just because that's how they've always been done. We ought to give thought to our ways. And I'm a practical application guy. I want to take what I learn, I want to take what I read and be able to apply it. So we're going to talk about some practical application here for a few minutes. So how can we establish our family on God's word? How can we instill a biblical worldview in our family? Okay, how can we ourselves be consistent with the spiritual disciplines? How can we be intentional about discipling our family? And like I said, I think if we're being honest, we all know what we should do. We all know that these things are important. But it's difficult sometimes to be disciplined enough to do it. I tell my kids that discipline is doing what needs to be done when it needs to be done, even when you don't feel like doing it. I think that's, a, that's difficult for all of us, no matter what age you are. Um, so I read this in a book that without a system, all you have is wishful thinking. So with that being said, I'm going to share just a few concepts that have helped me and my family. I know, looking out here, I know each family is in a different season of life. Most of you have different ages of kids all over the place, okay? But that's why these are concepts, okay? They're concepts that you can take and use, hopefully, in your season of life, in your situation, okay? Um, I also want to say I'm not sharing these because I think this is the only way to do things. I'm not sharing it because I think that we have it figured out. And we do things perfectly because it's certainly not the case, trust me. Okay, um, but I'm just sharing a few things that I have learned and concepts that have helped me and my family. 
in our, in our personal walk and also um, with discipling our family. Okay, so um, the first one is a concept I learned from a book called Atomic Habits. It's called habit stacking. So it's just basically taking something you already do and stacking something else on top of it. Okay, it's a pretty simple concept. And uh, this is something that I have found to be very helpful for our family. Okay, so I think this can help us to talk about God's word as we sit at home and as we walk along the road, when we lie down and when we get up. It can help us to impress God's word on our children. So an example of this is car rides. Okay, we, we all probably spend a lot of time in the car, I would guess. Uh, so we have made the car ride to school each day a time of prayer for our family. Melinda actually started this several years ago when I was still teaching. I didn't take the kids to school, and she started this. And I remember, um, I think she was sick, and I took a day off work, and I took the kids into school that day. And we were like two blocks into the drive, and they just started saying prayer requests. And I was like, what is going on? What are they doing? Right? So they told me, you know, and they're like, they were so excited about it. It just blessed my soul that they wanted to do that, and they wanted to, to do that time of prayer. So... Um, that's something now that I work here, I take them to school frequently, and um, it's a blessing to be a part of that. Maybe I know whenever I taught, I drove to work by myself. So it's something I did is I just, every day on the way to work, I turned the radio off and I just spent time in prayer myself. Uh, maybe it's turning off the radio and listening to God's word on your Bible app. I don't know what it is, but again, it's a concept. Um, another example is bedtime, okay? I know bedtime can be pretty stressful if you have young kids, so I see some of you are kind of shaking your heads. Um, bedtime can be a little bit stressful sometimes, but it's a perfect opportunity to do family devotions, okay? Um, we've read, prayed, and sang or listened to a song uh, every night for several years. I say sang or listened because I used to sing a worship song to my kids for a long time, and then as they got older, they realized how terrible of a singer I am. <laughs> And somewhere along the way, we started, I started just playing a worship song on my phone instead. I think it's better for everybody that way. Um, but, um, you know, we rarely miss. If I'm not home, Melinda does this. And um, it's just, it's a blessing to be a part of. And like I said, over time, it makes a difference. You may, some nights you might not even feel like your kids are listening. Um, you know, it might be craziness and chaos, but over time... Um, it's just teaching them that God's word is important and they're learning God's word in that way. Um, so the kids love it. I don't think they would let me skip even if I wanted to. So um, your kids will enjoy that if that's not something you already do. Um, last quick example here, dinner time, I think is another great example. Okay, uh, most likely you have a meal with your family frequently. Okay, it's a great time where you can uh, you could pray, you could read God's word, do different things like that. But um, we use that time to connect. So we have a few games that we play at dinner time. Um, we play the question game pretty frequently. And what we do is basically one person will ask a question, everybody else at the table has to answer it. And our kids have gotten pretty good at asking good questions, a little too good sometimes, because uh, they, they ask some hard questions, some thought-provoking questions. Uh, we play another game called the hot seat. And basically we choose one person to be in the hot seat and everybody else in the family has to say what they love about that person makes them feel really uncomfortable, but um, it's a good way to build each other up. It teaches them the importance of giving compliments. Um, so there's tons of examples. Again, this is just a concept that you can apply to your family, your situation, your context. Okay, the second one, I'm going to try to go through these kind of quick. The second one is controlling your environment. Okay, so we cannot control the environment that our kids are in when they leave our house. Okay, we just can't. Like when they go to school, when they go places, we can't control the environment that they're in. But when they're in our house, we can control that environment. And what I would challenge you to do is evaluate the environment that's in your home. So what's important to you? What is your family value? Okay, and whatever it is, you should shape your environment to prioritize that and to promote that. Okay, so um, two things with this. Um, if there's something you want to do, something you value, you should remove obstacles so that thing is easy to do. Okay, if there's something that you want to avoid, you should obviously create obstacles um, or potentially even maybe get rid of that thing or eliminate it. So um, I have an example from our house, and you're going to judge me, okay? We, we're a little extreme on this, but 
um, about six years ago, we got rid of Wi-Fi at our house. We don't have Wi-Fi, so it's kind of crazy, right? Um, but and it, I'm certainly, I was expecting somebody to get up and walk out, like, I'm out of here. This is, this is crazy, okay? Um, and I'm certainly not suggesting that you do that. I'm just using it as an example. It's been healthy for our family. It eliminates a lot of distractions, um, and if I'm prone to be a workaholic if I'm left unchecked, so it, it kind of keeps me in balance there as well. Um, and there would be many less extreme versions of this, like with the, with the TV maybe, you know, you hide the remote, and you put the remote somewhere where you have to get up and go in the other room to get it, or you take the batteries out, or whatever the case is, I don't know. But you create some kind of boundaries. I'll often put my phone on the dresser in our bedroom and close the door when I get home because I'm less likely to, to be on it if it's in there than if it's in my pocket. Okay, on the flip side of that, you want to remove obstacles for things that um, you want to do. So if you want to read your Bible before bed at night, you can put your Bible on your pillow, right? Or if you want your family to read, you should have books that are out and easily accessible and visible or maybe set aside a time where your family reads together. Again, I don't know what this looks like for you, but it's a concept, it's an example, something that you can take with you, okay? And the last concept here that I'm going to share with you is taking advantage of teachable moments. So this one's pretty simple, okay? I'm sure we've all thought of this before, but um, the thing about teachable moments is, is it's a lot easier to let them go past, right? It's a lot easier just to let them slide and not take advantage of them, okay? Um, because most of the time it requires an investment of time and energy. Those teachable moments do. And sometimes they can be awkward or uncomfortable or difficult conversations, okay? But I think we just need to be intentional to recognize them and take advantage of them. And they're all over the place if you're, if you're willing to, to watch for them, okay? Um, I think an example we can all relate to, um, do any of your kids struggle to get along with each other? Okay, I, all right, I was thinking that might be the case. I, I was hoping my kids weren't the only ones. Okay, so as frustrating as it is and as much as it wears on you, there's so many teachable moments with that because I have a spoiler alert for you. Your kids are gonna deal with difficult people their entire life, okay? You guys, I'm sure everyone in here, you deal with difficult people right now, okay? Um, so uh, again, there's a lot of teachable moments in those situations. Um, with my son Isaiah, I've started using a phrase and trying to recognize teachable moments. Like I said earlier, we have to demonstrate biblical manhood or show it. And um, I've started just saying to Isaiah, when we see something or if he does something that I think exemplifies what a man should be, according to the Bible, I'll say, like, I'm really proud of you. That's, that's what men do. Or if we see someone do something and I'll say, did you see that over there? Like, that's what men do. And just taking advantage of those teachable moments or the, or the flip side. Like if I'm being selfish and I do something I'll, and I have to apologize to him, I'll be like, I shouldn't have done that. That's not what men do. Right, so just using, finding ways to incorporate those things. And it's crazy too, because I've, uh, I've heard my daughters tell them a couple times, Isaiah, that's not what men do, right? <laughs> so they're, they're catching on to it too, and I think they like to be able to do that. But they're seeing that as well. And again, we wanna, we wanna demonstrate um, what men, what biblical manhood is to our, our daughters as well. So again, I just believe in taking advantage of these teachable moments, even if they're difficult, but it's, I think it's an important part of discipling our children. So again, take those three concepts, make them your own. I pray that um, they can be helpful to you as you are diligent to uh, disciple your family. So in closing here, I'm really passionate about family discipleship because um, honestly, it's not just about our families. The stakes are a lot higher than that. It's not just about you and your kids. It's about generations to come. It's about your grandkids and your great-grandkids and your great-great-grandkids. The way we live our lives and the way we do family is gonna impact generations that we'll never see. Our marriage and the way we parent is gonna be the blueprint that our kids take into their adult lives. And I don't know about you, but I wanna give my kids a godly blueprint to follow. I want them to have a biblical worldview and I want them to go into adulthood with a biblical perspective of what marriage and what family is. So in closing here, God has given us a really important responsibility. I pray that each one of us would take it seriously and I pray that we would commit wholeheartedly to discipling our families to know, love, and follow Jesus Christ. So let's pray. 
Lord, I come to you and I just thank you for this time that we've had. I thank you for each couple who is here that took the time to invest in their marriage and into their parenting and their family. Lord, um, parenting is really hard. And I just pray that you would give us wisdom, that you give us discernment, that you would help us to keep the main thing the main thing. And Lord, I pray that as we teach our kids your word and we pour into them, Lord, that they would have a cohesive biblical worldview. They wouldn't have a fragmented worldview. Lord, I pray that we could prepare them and equip them to go out into this world and be a light for you. So Lord, I just pray, pray a blessing over every single couple here and their family. And I pray that as we leave this place that um, you would just give us a, a hunger for your word and a desire to disciple our family and grow closer to you as a family. Lord, we thank you for what you're gonna do. We love you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen.